We'll begin reading tonight at the um, ninth verse of Revelation chapter 21. <coughs> and there came unto me one of the seven angels who had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come here, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the, 12, uh, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written on the gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates of it and its wall. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall of it, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light of it. And the nations of them who are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither he that worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they who are written in the Lamb's book of life, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life which bore twelve kinds of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they uh, need no light, either the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, what we've just read is God's descriptive terminology of a future beautiful city. There's some difference of opinion as to whether... This uh, city is uh, completely figurative, uh, or if uh, the terminology here describes a physical place. And probably the best answer would be for us to realize that in the book of Revelation, which is a figurative book, anything that's literal will also have a figurative meaning, or almost anything. Uh, so I, I would say the best conclusion is this, that we're speaking about a literal city uh, because this is not the only place such a city is mentioned. 
And in other places, it's quite evident that we're speaking of a prepared place. Remember when Jesus was here with the disciples just before he went uh, to the cross, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And so and he speaks of it as being a place to live. He says, there are many mansions there. And he says, now, if this weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. So uh, we can be confident, I'm quite sure, that the city about which uh, we have this descriptive material is a literal city. The only problem we should have is uh, just what uh, the figurative uh, significance is of each of these terms. And, and we can tell that... Uh, the descriptive material is at least to a large extent figurative because uh, we have here words and numbers that are used figuratively uh, throughout the Bible. For instance, we have the number of 12 used uh, very uh, frequently and also multiples of 12 like 144. Now, notice in the very last verse that we read in chapter 22, verse 5, the last phrase, it says, they shall reign forever and ever. So this is a royal city. You can't really reign without having something to reign over. And notice uh, in verse 24 of chapter 21, we're told that the nations of them who are saved walk in the light of it. And, and it says they can go in. It says the gates will not be shut and they can. the nations bring their glory and honor to it. So obviously there's some uh, beings that are called the nations that are not part of the citizenry of this particular city. Now it must be a, a very magnificent place uh, because it's, uh, it's a particularly prepared place. It's a royal place. It's the place from which uh, God's whole operation will be ruled throughout the eternal ages. Now we gather that this uh, uh, that we see happening here, that is, this city coming down out of heaven from God, as is described twice, uh, we assume that that's quite a ways in the future yet because uh, we, don't, uh, we don't see the city until after the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth as described uh, in the Old Testament in many places and, and uh, that uh, with, with, of which we have an outline in chapter 20, uh, this, uh, this time that's future. So notice again in chapter 21, verse 1, that uh, he sees, John foresees uh, a new heaven and a new earth. And then in, in verse 2 of chapter 21, he sees this holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out, uh, out of heaven. And it's prepared, it says, as a bride. Now in, in verse 2, it said as a bride. And yet in verse 9, it says uh, that he's going to show the bride and instead he shows the city which would seem to indicate that he's equating the bride with the city. And this gives rise uh, to uh, the belief that the whole thing is figurative, that this is just figurative language for uh, uh, the church and its uh, eternal purposes of God. But uh, you can't fit the rest of it. That might work fine if you were only using this, but you can't fit the rest of Bible prophecy in there. Remember last week when we were speaking of Abraham seeking a city and uh, he has a part in the city God hath prepared for them a city it says so there is a literal city now there's some problems presenting themselves because we're told that this city is uh, so long and so wide and then its height is the same as its uh, length and its breadth which would make it a cube and this is hard for us to understand because then it describes the wall which is said to be a certain height now if we put these uh, measurements in our own terminology, we would have a, a city that's about 1,400 miles cube. That is, it would be on a straight line about from here, uh, if, if you were going to uh, delineate it, it'd be about from here to, uh, say, Montreal, Canada. And then uh, it would extend uh, over almost to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, then uh, uh, that, it would encompass about that area. And that's not too hard for us to comprehend. It'd be a rather large city, of course, uh, but uh, there's been a lot of saved people if you go back all through the ages. And uh, so uh, and this wouldn't be too hard uh, to have a city, but when you think about it being that same height, then, uh, then you begin to have problems. And I don't have a good answer to that. I, I was reading uh, some of the 
uh, commentary uh, on this particular passage uh, among some of the better known uh, Bible teachers of our time and one feels like it's a it's a pyramid affair with the the throne of God right at the top and it's it's very uh, imaginative the way he depicts it and another one says no it's a it's a great sphere with the cube inside and another one uh, has this idea and the other idea and I I don't like to disappoint you uh, but uh, I really don't know exactly how to put it all together and uh, I'm uh, I'm not real disappointed about that, though, because uh, I know I'm going to see it, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, going to enjoy anticipating. I, I know from God's description that it's just, uh, uh, you might say, just out of sight, <laughs> out of this world. <laughs> the uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians two nine, as we read last week, that the eye hath not seen. Uh, neither hath the ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for those that love him. And this is one of the things that he has prepared. And I think what he more or less has in mind is to giving, give us enough descriptive information so that uh, we, can, uh, we can come to the conclusion that it's, it's magnificent uh, above all description. And then he wants to give us uh, some figurative uh, language that will help us to understand uh, uh, just what it's all about and what he plans to do there. So let's go back and look some of the language and see what we can come up with. And the, at least the first time through, we'll think of, uh, of what might be the figurative connotation. Now, it doesn't particularly bother me that the inhabitants in the city uh, are described as the same because we do this sometimes... Uh, uh, when we speak of uh, uh, our hometown, for instance, uh, we're talking of the people there, and sometimes we're talking of the city itself. A city really isn't a city except for the people, and the people have to have a place in order for it to be a city. So many times a city and the people of that city uh, are used, the two are used synonymously. When we say, uh, uh, for instance, if we say Chicago is a windy city, we're not talking about the people in it, are we? Uh, we're talking about its location, but we say it's that kind of a city. But if we were to say that uh, uh, um, Chicago is a friendly city, well, we wouldn't be speaking of the city itself. We'd be speaking of the people. So the, the uh, connotation can be either way. So that shouldn't bother us too much if we just let the Bible be used like we use language. Uh, but I think we need to get the vantage point of John. See, in uh, verse 2, we're not told exactly what the vantage point is, but it must be from the earth because he sees this new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. It would be as though he were to look up and way in the distance he sees this brilliant glow. But then notice in verse 10, he's carried away in the spirit and placed upon a high mountain. And it's as though God wants to give him a different vantage point as though he were watching it uh, more or less settle down to earth. Now, uh, uh, Lance and I were visiting on the way up and he suggested maybe this 1,500 mile height uh, was just this, uh, describing the domain of the city. In other words, uh, we may not have the same perspective as we do now. I was thinking... Let's suppose that uh, John the Apostle was trying to describe for his people a high-rise condominium. Let's suppose that uh, he foresaw that somebody would be living uh, on the uh, 43rd floor of a modern condominium somewhere, or something like that, you know, a high-rise apartment building. And he was to say the house was, uh, uh, we might say, uh, 100 feet uh, square, and it was uh, 300 feet high. Well, uh, you see, that would just be all out of proportion for a hearer in his day. They, they just couldn't conceive a habitation being uh, built in that dimension, couldn't they? could they? A person in John's day. Because uh, they would never have heard of an elevator, and uh, they would understand something about what we call gravity, and they couldn't see how that could possibly uh, be practical. So... Uh, uh, 
even more so, we should expect uh, some limit to our comprehension of uh, something that God has, the dimensions of something God has prepared for us when we won't even be subject to the physical laws at all. So uh, uh, I suppose that uh, it's literally in some way, in some respect, going to be just as high as it is long and wide. I, I expect to see it that way, but I don't know how to picture it in my mind and I don't think I'm going to try very hard. I, I know I'm not going to make a pyramid out of it or a, a cube inside of a, a glass bowl or something like that because uh, I'd probably be, probably be wrong anyway. So I'll just wait and see um, about that part of it. But the, the vantage point of John is uh, evidently uh, a, a great high mountain like on earth and God is seeing him. It doesn't even have to be a literal mountain. It might be one that God uh, has just set him on in the spirit, so to speak. But notice it is descending out of heaven from God. Now, it doesn't mean that God had just made this because when Jesus left 2,000 years ago, he says, I am going to prepare. And he said he was going to prepare a place for the apostles specifically and others. And we know that this is the place he was preparing for the apostles because it's got them right here. We can see it uh, as, as we look here. First, it says it has the glory of God. Now, I don't know if you've considered what this glory, word glory means. Uh, most of us that have been uh, involved at all in personal soul winning, we use a, uh, quite frequently, we use a scripture in the book of Romans, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, what does it mean to come short of the glory of God? I found that, that that's a good question if you want to witness to somebody about his soul salvation you just read that verse and say uh, you can start out from the uh, beginning what does it mean we all uh, what does that mean that, that uh, or all that is all have sinned what does it mean all well everybody will say uh, what does it mean all have sinned well all of us have done something wrong uh, well what does it mean we've come short of the glory of God well then you know he's answering right along and then he, he just doesn't know what it means and you say well what does the word glory mean and uh, the average person just doesn't know. They've never thought about what, what does glory mean. Well, in the Bible, glory means excellence on display. And uh, so what we're saying here, that if we, because we've sinned, we've come short of uh, the opportunity to be where God's excellence is on display. We've come short of his glory. And uh, so what Christ does uh, when we uh, avail ourselves of that which he did for us on Calvary's cross, uh, he, uh, he makes it so that we can see. We, uh, we're reinstated so that we can see the glory of God. And so it's saying that this has the glory of God. What does that mean then? Well, this city is going to display for us all of the excellencies of our God. And then we notice that it says that it's going to be like jasper. Well, the stone that's, uh, uh, that's described as a jasper here is, descri is, uh, is interpreted by most to be uh, a clear stone, something like our diamond, and maybe even refers to a diamond. Notice it says it has 12 gates. And that's the uh, first, I believe, of uh, several uses of the number 12 in this passage. And where 12 is used figuratively in the Bible, it's, it's representative. In other words, the 12 sons of Jacob represent all of Jacob's sons that ever would be. And the 12 apostles represents all of those who would ever go out on a commission from Christ and be his disciples and so forth. It's a representative number wherever you see it. So uh, I'm sure 12 gates represents the fact that you can come from every direction, you might say, into this place. There's, there's no uh, area that, that's roped off, in other words. There's free access. And then it says that at the, at the uh, gates there are 12 angels. Well, this depicts for us at least the, the figurative truth that the angels have to do with uh, the final judgment. When Christ told parables, and he was speaking of the end times, uh, like the harvest. He said, the angels shall come and harvest. Uh, you can see this in a couple of places in uh, Matthew chapter 13 in his parable. So we know that angels have something to do with the final harvest. And so it's, a, it's an apt place uh, for them to be at the entrances. In other words, they have something to do 
with uh, helping to determine who can enter and who can't enter. Then we notice that uh, on the gates are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, or actually, uh, I believe this is the twelve sons of Israel. Uh, that is, uh, each of uh, each of uh, Jacob's sons will have his name on one of the gates. This is to remind us, as Jesus said in John 4:22, that salvation is of the Jews. Now, if this bothers you, or uh, if you weren't here when we were di- uh, discussing this, uh, we have to remember that God called the whole room, uh, the whole human race, to Himself twice, through Adam and then through Noah, and the entire human race left God's direction. And that's why uh, the prophet Isaiah could say, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to our own way. And uh, the only way that God could have a witness on this earth was to call out one man that would be faithful. And he gave certain promises to his progeny. Actually, he didn't choose a special people. He chose a certain man. And that special people happens to be the physical, lineal descendants of that particular man. And nobody will ever enter into God's uh, provinces except he be a son of Abraham, that one that he was called out. And of course, the book of Galatians explains to us very carefully, and also Romans, how we become sons of Abraham. It's because we are one with Christ who is a son of Abraham. Now, it's only through the, the nation of Israel that we have the Bible. Every book in the Bible was written by a, a lineal descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with a possible exception of one, uh, Luke, who had involved himself uh, by faith uh, in much the same way we had. So they were all sons of Israel. Christ was born of the tribe of Judah uh, from a natural uh, standpoint. And so you see, salvation is of the Jews. The very fact that it comes, salvation is in Christ. We see salvation is the Jews. And so you cannot enter any other way. You cannot enter uh, through Mohammedism or Buddhism or anything else. Just uh, If you want to hear this from the lips of Christ himself, he, he said it to a woman who practiced another religion. As I said, it's in John 4.22. He says, you don't know what you worship. We know what we worship, speaking as a Jew, for salvation is of the Jews. And this is... Uh, uh, this is descriptive of that, that uh, the gates have the names of the twelve tribes of Israel because it's only through uh, that that one can enter in. Verse 13, we see uh, that uh, these gates face in all directions. And we, the, the, the wall is on twelve foundations. And you can only get into this city, it, that means it bars, you might say, Figuratively, it bars anybody who did not come uh, by the foundation that was laid by the apostles. Uh, hold your place here just a moment and turn back to Ephesians um, chapter 2 and you'll get the picture because it's in that chapter that uh, God uses this figure of speech. See, in uh, Ephesians chapter two nineteen. Now, therefore... Ye are no more uh, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. This means those of you who were not lineal descendants of Abraham, you were strangers and and foreigners. But you're no longer that. But in uh, Ephesians 2.20, but are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So the only uh, way to God is built upon the foundations of the apostles, and that's the picture that's shown here in, uh, in the picture of the wall, and anybody else would be barred, so to speak, in a figurative way, from... Uh, uh, citizenship in this uh, in this uh, beautiful city unless they came uh, by those who laid the foundation as described in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 it, it speaks of the measuring this terminology is used anytime 
uh, a city is being measured out. The, the problem that we have is with verse 16 where we're told it's four square, 12 furlongs is about 1,400, 1,500 miles, and it says the height and length breadth are equal and this uh, as I said would not be so hard except we're told that the wall was uh, uh, 144 cubits in verse 17 and that would be a little over 200 feet high so it's a little hard to visualize a, a wall this high with gates in it and then it being uh, part of a city of this height but it'll all be cleared up for us one day. Then the other thing that's a little difficult, it speaks of pure gold like clear glass. And then uh, again in the verse 21, the last phrase, it tells us the pure gold as it were transparent glass. And uh, so this will be a, a, a special kind of gold. Gold stands for God's glory in manifestation when it's used figuratively in the Bible. And uh, so his glory will be manifested here. And then uh, the uh, all types of jewelry of uh, jewels and notice there's 12 of those and this speaks of the great variety uh, of the preciousness now usually when uh, precious stones are used figuratively in the Bible they speak of the very heart of God his heart and mind and his thoughts towards us remember the high priest wore these 12 uh, precious stones as near as we can determine the same 12 precious stones on his breast, one representing each of the twelve tribes of Israel. This was back in their religious system, uh, representing the fact that God was carrying them next to his own heart uh, and that they were always in his thoughts and uh, in his mind. And the precious stone stands for God so much uh, uh, more, God in his essence, how he, how he is towards us rather than how he shows himself towards us. The manifestation, the outshowing, would be depicted by the gold, whereas uh, his, his own being and characteristics and essence would be depicted by the, uh, by the precious stones. And of course, he shares his own characteristics with us. And that's why the uh, precious stones also can uh, refer to us. Now, when we get down to the 21st verse, we find that each of the 12 gates is a pearl. Now, uh, that's a little unusual because that'd be a rather large pearl. But uh, a pearl stands for the church corporately. And this will be primarily the residents, the chief residents of this city uh, will be the members of the church, which means all the saved people from uh, the day of Pentecost unto the coming of the Lord. So, um, uh, and this picture is used in the church. Uh, the church is the pearl of great price uh, for which... The merchantman gave all, as we find in the parable in uh, Matthew chapter 13. And the pearl is a very good picture of the church. It's the only, uh, it's the only precious stone that comes from the sea. All others are mined from the land. And uh, the, uh, this is a picture of the fact that the uh, church comes from the great mass and turmoil of unsaved humanity. The, the pearl comes from the sea. And uh, any other stone could be cut and uh, shaped and polished without destroying it. But if you ever cut a pearl, you would immediately ruin it. It's only valuable in its unity. Whereas you could have a, uh, a ruby or a, or a diamond and uh, if it were cut right half in two, it would still have value if it were shaped right and polished and so forth, but not a pearl. It, it, if a, a pearl is only valuable in its unity. Also, a pearl is uh, the only precious uh, stone or only jewel uh, that uh, comes from a living organism. You know how a pearl is made, don't you? It's made inside of an oyster. And it starts out as just something... Uh, just a speck of insignificant dirt. And as this living being down in the depths of the sea gives us of itself. Uh, you see the oyster here is a picture of Christ who came down into this filth of the sea where we are. He came from his glory on high down into the filth of the sea where we were. And then 
uh, you might say, we pricked his side. Our sin pricked his side. And that's how a, uh, a pearl gets started. Uh, uh, part of the dirt from the bottom of the sea uh, irritates the side of the oyster. And uh, to protect himself from that irritant, he begins to put of him his own self. This is called uh, the nacre, uh, uh, the knacker of the, the uh, uh, oyster. Is, uh, he takes of his own self, his, of his own secretions, and he wraps and he wraps and wraps. It's a long process, and he gradually makes uh, this beautiful pearl. Well, this is, uh, this is what Christ did. Sin was an offense in his side as he came from the glory on high, on high and came down in our abode, which is the mire of the sea, as, uh, as depicted for us in Isaiah. And then uh, in, the, uh, in the hidden place where nobody was watching, that, uh, that pearl, you see, grew and grew and grew. It's the corporate church. You aren't not a pearl. You're not a pearl. You're part of a pearl. And uh, so... Uh, you, you say, well, how do we get 12 pearls here? Well, it, it, 12 is a representative number. It tells you it represents something. So it doesn't have to be 12 pearls. But uh, we do need to see the, what the picture of the pearl is. And, of course, uh, at the rapture of the church is when the pearl is, is glorified. It's taken out of the mire of the sea where it finds itself. Can you imagine anything more beautiful coming out of something less... Uh, out of a less desirable habitation or environment than a beautiful pearl coming uh, from the very muddy depths of the sea. But one day that pearl will be manifested, you see. And in all of its brilliance, uh, it will glow before a, a holy God. So the pearl is the, uh, is the perfect example of the church. You know, there. There are not only pearls, genuine pearls, but there are imitation pearls, and there are also cultured pearls. Uh, they're not the same, you know. Uh, a cultured pearl uh, is, uh, is still a pearl, but uh, uh, it's not a genuine pearl. Uh, I guess we could have a lesson on, uh, on how pearls are made, couldn't we? But you'd never know the difference between a cultured pearl and a genuine pearl except you x-rayed it or you broke it off and oh, open to see the difference. But God knows the difference. Anybody can should be able to tell an imitation pearl because it would just be made out of plastic or something like that. Uh, and uh, So we should be able to detect <coughs> imitation pearls, but we, we not necessarily be able to detect a cultured pearl. That's something that looks like the real thing, but it isn't. You have to go inside to find out whether it is or not but anyway God is fashioning for himself in the depths of the sea so to speak this precious gem which uh, uh, which is uh, the church as depicted uh, by the pearl of great price notice he says there's no temple there that's because the temple is a place where God's glory shows forth in the whole city and the beings the people that are one with him uh, shall be uh, in that position. In verse 24, the nations of them uh, who, sh shall, uh, who are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor. Remember, there's not only a new heaven. There's a new heaven, a new uh, earth, and a new Jerusalem. And remember, you have the new heaven, and you have the new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God to the new earth. Some say... They think it stays suspended above the earth. But I see, uh, I see no reason to say that. It would seem to me that when John was taken up into the high mountain, he, uh, he saw the earth, the, the plainest language would indicate the new Jerusalem settles down on the new earth. And that uh, it's just the capital city, you might say, because there's kings of the earth who bring in their glory and so forth. And as I pointed out before, if someone's going to reign forever and ever, then there has to be subjects uh, to the reign. Uh, isn't that so, would you say? And they bring glory and honor into it. Now, in chapter 22, uh, we want to look into this matter of the pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. And then we find that on either side of the river, 
is the tree of life that has 12 kinds of fruit. Here again we have the number 12. Now we, we came across in chapter 21 earlier, we came across the fountain of the water of life. See that's in chapter 21 verse 6. Now we shouldn't have to wonder who the fountain of the water of life is is because he's Jehovah God. He claims, he calls himself that in uh, several places. I suppose the uh, plainest place would be in Jeremiah, and I didn't write it down, so I'll have to uh, look for it just a moment. I think one of the places would be in the second chapter uh, of Jeremiah where uh, he says that uh, Israel has committed two evils. They've departed from... Uh, the uh, fountain of life and they've hewn out to themselves broken cisterns here in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters now this is uh, the Lord Jehovah speaking see in verse 12 uh, be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be uh, horribly afraid, be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. This word Lord here is Jehovah. That is, God as he uh, manifests himself towards man. That's, what, that's who Jehovah is. Is God operating towards man. And that is the fountain of living water, or the fountain of the water of life. God himself, Jehovah God, and the Jehovah of the Old Testament, of course, is the Christ of the New Testament because Jesus Christ is God to us. Uh, he, it's, that, it's the Emmanuel nature of God. God among us. When Christ came into this earth, he expressed uh, that side of his character that he wanted to have do with man. So this is the fountain from which uh, life comes. And we could, we, we'll see it probably some other places. So we have the fountain of the water of life, and then we have the river of the water of life, and then we have the tree of life. We've already had the book of life, and we, sh we showed that the book of life is not just a, a name written down, but it's, uh, it's God's whole program for you written down. It's, uh, it's what God has in mind for you projected. That's what's in the book of life. of where the where life comes from. That's God himself as he operates towards man. It's the flowing of life towards man from the fountain. And so the river is God life. <clears throat> and it's though, here's this great river. It flows on forever. And God placed you into that flow so that you might be a part of his great ongoing life. And the tree of life is that life as it manifests itself to you the outworking uh, of the life. It's how that life is enjoyed. And the figure here is that if you want a big ripe uh, peach, you go over here and enjoy it. And if you want a big ripe plum, you go over here and enjoy it. It's the, the uh, appropriation of that life, or you might say the consumption or utilization of, uh, of that life that flows in the river of life out from the fountain of life for those who are written in the book of life. Now, we want to spend a little time with this matter of the river of life. And uh, here's why we want to do this. You may have come to the conclusion, well, we just haven't learned too much about this eternal city. We can see that it's rather magnificent. And uh, but, but what are we going to do there? And uh, what does all this mean? And... Uh, uh, What's it going to be like? And such as that. Well, God has been able to see that he just simply cannot describe it for us in the way that we could fully comprehend it. We have to take some of the language that he uses. We have to take this language, for instance, that Abraham, was, it was enough of it was revealed to Abraham that he never thought about earthly things. He kept his mind's eye glued on that city that was to come, although he knew it was thousands of years away. And we have to take language like we find in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where we're told that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus Christ endured the suffering and the shame, even to death on the cross. 
and because he had his eye on this that's going to be prepared in the future and whatever the the hindrance was or whatever the trial was even to uh, a death of shame on the cross he counted it uh, as uh, as worthwhile because he had his mind's eye on this uh, that God had in his eternal plans and it's the type of thing that would have caused the, the apostle Paul to say uh, that uh, call everything he went through light affliction have you read in the book of Second Corinthians where he lists all the things that he endured uh, he was shipwrecked and he was beaten several times with 39 stripes and he was jailed and he found himself naked and he was hunger and he was uh, tormented by uh, every type of way beset by robbers and, and jail everything that could happen to a person and then he had a, a, some sort of a, a, a bodily impairment and you know what he called all that he called it this light affliction which is but for a moment and he says this light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory he says all this is working for me and I don't have my mind on that I have my mind on this that's going to be by the way that's second corinthians 4 17 and then in romans chapter 8 uh, he says the whole of creation is waiting you might say just on tiptoes waiting until uh, god's uh, sons the ones that will receive the inheritance shall come into their heritage we have to look at that type of language or language like uh, we've already discussed in second corinthians first uh, corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 uh, the eye hath not seen nor the ear heard nor neither hath it entered in the heart of man the things that God hath prepared uh, for those that love him so it's beyond the scope of our comprehension now God has given certain individuals a little greater vision of this than we have had he gave this to Abraham uh, he gave it to King David and there's one point that David wants to get across to you that whatever it is you're going to be satisfied you're not going to be disappointed and we're going to see that he makes that a, a very very uh, uh, pointed uh, assertion and so David was able to see a little uh, more than, than we can see even with this language we have in Revelation and Paul saw, saw more than we're able to see and he said that it actually, uh, you might say, uh, just snatched him out of this world to the extent that God had to, uh, to send him a bodily affliction to let him know he was still a citizen of this world. He said, uh, you know, I have this thorn in the flesh. I don't know, uh, I don't know what he had, but uh, I know it hurt. And because the best descriptive he could may, uh, use for what was wrong with him was he had a thorn in the flesh. And I know it hurt him. And he said he asked God three times uh, to, uh, to let him uh, be uh, free from this bodily ailment. And he says, God said, no, you just have to appropriate my grace. And he says, Paul, if I weren't to afflict you like this, that you'd be so lifted up and exalted, you couldn't do your work on earth. You'd, uh, as the saying goes, you'd be so heavenly minded that you could be no earthly good. Now, I know that's used in the wrong connotation most of the time. Really, you're not any earthly good till you're heavenly minded. Uh, but uh, uh, Paul would have just, uh, you know, he just, uh, he'd have just wanted to go so bad uh, uh, to be with the Lord that, uh, that he just wouldn't have been able to do his work down here. And so he saw more. And, of course, John saw more. And uh, uh, God let Stephen have some insight in the end of the seventh chapter of Acts into this that was to come so God has been pleased to reveal somewhat more of the magnificence of this future to certain ones and they have just opened the door a little bit drawn aside the curtain so that it, for those who really trust God and really believe that he's a good God and really believe that he has great things prepared for us they can see with their mind's eye better than they could perceive uh, if uh, if there were a more detailed, precise, literal, uh, and a more definitive uh, description of what, uh, what we have here. He wants us to 
believe him when he says, for instance, in Ephesians 2.7, uh, he says that the, the reason God has saved us in the first place, so that in the ages to come, he might uh, show forth the exceeding greatness of his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And he, he, in other words, he wants to spend all of eternity showing us what a good God and what a God of variety he can be. And this is what the, we're being told by this 12 manner, manner of fruit, that it's going to be a very exciting, a very varied time. And we pointed out before that the way Satan traps particularly young people into his snare, he convinces them that... Uh, God is sort of a, a pious old gray beard that never smiles and uh, his main interest is to keep you under his thumb and uh, his main characteristic is he doesn't have any fun and he don't want you to have any and if you're going to get any fun you better get it here before you get there uh, and the only real reason for going to heaven is because it's better to put up with that kind of monotony than to burn in hell you know that's the type of thing that Satan uh, gets across uh, to our young people and this uh, causes them to want to live it up here because uh, it's sure not going to be that much fun there uh, in, uh, and it's going to be a long time and uh, it's going to be rather monotonous and uh, I better get my kicks while I can well of course this is just uh, to misunderstand God so what we want to do is to go into the Psalms and see uh, some of the things David said he probably was better at getting the thought across to us than any other of the human writers and uh, uh, we'll start in Psalm 16 and just uh, uh, see his, uh, the results of his glimpse of some of this glory that was to come in Psalm 16 verse 11 of course the way he was permitted to come to this type of a conclusion he had this attitude see in in uh, uh, of this 16th Psalm, verse 5, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. He says, I I'm, I'm not looking for anything here. And he says in verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, my flesh shall rest in hope. Look at verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. In this... Uh, word pleasures probably would be a word that we would more nearly translate delights or things to delight me forevermore he says I, uh, life with my God when I get in his uh, presence is just going to be a series of delights in uh, down in uh, Psalm 17 verse 15 he says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. He says, God, I know one thing, that when I see you face to face, I'm going to be satisfied. And he carries this theme through. Uh, look, for instance, in uh, Psalm 36. Psalm 36, verse 8. Well, let's read verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures, or the river of thy delights. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. See, he's looking with anticipation. He says, you're the fountain, God, and out from you uh, flows a river, and it's a river of delights. And uh, he says, I know that uh, when I get to be in your household, when I receive my inheritance, that uh, uh, I'll be abundantly satisfied. I'll be satisfied, he says. I know that. Whatever I don't see, I know uh, that uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be satisfied. 
Now, uh, this the matter of this river of his pleasures. Let's uh, look at Psalm 46. Psalm 45 is a very interesting one where uh, it, it told uh, some of the... It, that's a psalm about the greatness of the king that shall rule in those days. But uh, look at uh, Psalm 46, verse 4. There's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High, or that is where God dwells. He says there's a river there, and the streams of it will make glad. It speaks of drinking of the gladness of, a, of a God's life. And also, back in Psalm 47, uh, 45, notice the seventh verse. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassian out of, uh, out of the ivory palaces uh, whereby... Uh, they have made uh, thee glad. Now it's speaking here of the king and the king's court and the king's uh, queen and uh, of the royalty. And we're told that, the, that there's an anointment with the oil of gladness. Now, if you could only comprehend what this means, oil when it's used figuratively, especially a fragrant oil like this, is the empowering. And what God is really saying is, He's going to give you added ability to have gladness. That is to say, he's going to increase your uh, uh, ability to enjoy. Uh, you, you think of in this life in terms of, oh, what I would like to do. But just think about uh, your, um, your horizons of enjoyment. You see, in our present constitution, we couldn't possibly absorb all the wonders that God has for us. So he's got to expand our enjoyment mechanism, you might say. And he does this by anointing us with the oil of gladness. Some, see, David just was able to use this, uh, this beautiful type of, of language that, uh, that depicts for us. But he, he's not through telling us. Uh, he, see, David doesn't really believe that you quite comprehend him when he says... I want to get one point across. You will be satisfied. Don't worry about that. You're going to be satisfied. So don't ask those questions about, well, can I take my pet kitten with me to heaven? Or uh, will uh, I have the same uh, 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 love for my grandchildren? Or uh, will uh, uh, my uh, husband's first wife love him more? Or what have you, you know? <laughs> or how about his childhood sweetheart and all that? David says... Quit worrying about that. Let me get this across to you. You will be satisfied. And you'll have a greater capacity for satisfaction to go along with it. So let's look in chapter 63. Verse 5. David says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Now, in all of these cases, David is looking forward. At the particular time when he wrote this psalm, he was a fugitive from Saul and actually thought he was going to be going to heaven pretty quick. And he was consoling himself. Well, that's all right. I know when I get over there with my God, I'll be satisfied. Because he didn't think his life was worth the proverbial plug nickel at that particular time. In uh, Psalm 65, verse 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. Do you get the point that David wants us to look forward to complete satisfaction. Uh, there's somebody uh, wrote a song uh, when uh, they read all those verses, and the name of the song is simply, I'll Be Satisfied. 
And so uh, you can be sure of that. You'll be satisfied. If God's put it there that many times. So if you sometimes read uh, this descriptive material about this beautiful city coming down out of heaven from God, uh, just uh, enter in with David. Well, I don't know all about it now, and I probably couldn't comprehend it with my level of uh, absorption. So let me just know that uh, God has planned great things of infinite variety, and I'll be satisfied. I won't have any complaints. I'll be satisfied. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for these words of comfort from your word. And God, help us to reach the point in our own relationship with you that we can say with our lips repeatedly, as David has said with his pen, I'll be satisfied. And might we live this life uh, taking whatever comes, realizing that it won't be very long and these light afflictions are but for a moment and that they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. God, might we live day by day in this wondrous anticipation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One more lesson in Revelation. I hope it's not anticlimactic.